Peace and love to everybody listening. My name is Yeldel Bay, also known as uh, Philip, also known as Angel. I hope everyone is good. I hope everyone is in good spirits listening right now. Uh, I'm definitely in good spirits right now, just, you know, communing with myself and making sure that um, everyone is clear on our history here. So actually, uh, I saw that a lot of people really liked my Moors in Europe video that I did not too long ago. Um, maybe about a year ago at this point i'm not sure uh, maybe i'll put up an i card in the uh corner so you guys can check that out or i'll put a, something in the in the description below so you can kind of see um what i was talking about in that but basically i was breaking down the moors history in europe and how the moors are essentially the progenitors of all the european races all the european dynasties and so on and so forth um if anyone has any questions please feel free to reach out to me leave a comment below uh, or check out the video because you know it's one thing to hear me claim it right now um in this video when that's not even the topic of this video versus actually watching that video in its entirety and then you know seeing where it goes from there so uh, i really appreciate it if everyone goes and checks that out and yeah so let's get started on the moorish history in america all right so the first thing that we got to tackle is um our habits meaning the way that we dress the way we represented ourselves here in america so here i got a couple um examples so right over here on the left this is it says right here whoops excuse me it says the indian representation of the costumes of the inca it says inca right here and his queen so this is actually how the incas used to dress or a representation of how the incas used to dress so you can see right here um the star or the sun both on the coronet on the um on the uh, on the crown and also as a diadem on the cape right you can also see the axe which again represents cutting out the useless and ungainly parts of the character in order to make the character symmetrical so it's it's basically said that the king is supposed to always be looking inward and looking at his own character cutting his character in a certain kind of way to make sure that his character is symmetrical for the good of his kingdom because he's the example same thing for her she is they're both the examples so because they are the rulers they have to cut their character to be in line and in sym symmetrical uh, with with um the greater empire and the greater dominion so as you can see right here um there's a few similarities and a few differences between these two so the first this is the these are the incas so that's when you get into the um the ancient carthaginians that went into uh, america and then settled into parts of um the the southern america so where the incas were and then over here in the middle you'll actually see this is a brother named kunishot um let me see if i can get a closer that's his name it's c-u-n-n-e-s-h-o-t-e -E. um it says right here c-u-n-n-e-s-h-o-t-e -E. kunishot um who was a cherokee chief and uh the so-called cherokee but we know the term is actually tasalagi which i should really be give me one second so i can actually write some of this down kunishot who was a uh, who was a Cherokee or Tasalagi chief, and I also typed the term Tasalagi as well. Tasalagi chief as well, and the Tasalagi were actually again would have known as Cherokee today. But Cherokee, the term Cherokee is actually a European corruption of the name Tsalagi. And the Tsalagi were actually very, very well known uh, as one of the so-called five civilized tribes of the old world. But um, really, that's that's really during their Christian conversions, pseudo-Christian conversion into being Cherokee. When they existed as the Tsalagi, they existed just as this. And so this this obviously is uh it, it ain't the same as what you're seeing on tv you know what i'm saying when it comes to the feathers in the head and the grass skirts and everything like that um 
that's a certain representation of a certain moor in america these moors were dealing more so with the royal lineages of nobility in america whereas some moors just worked the land some moors were more so of plain people some moors were forest culture some moors were straight up and down in towns and cities and uh that's what these moors were these moors were connected to all of that obviously because all of that is our science however um they were more so dressed up in the royal habit right again it says right here oh excuse me uh, <laughs> uh it says habit right here all right so we're also going to look at uh let's go here first so this also is the lineage of the Inca kings, right? You see a lot of kings here, right? This is how the Incas were demonstrating themselves, right? So you can also see the way that this Moor represents himself here. You can see the crown, you see the scepter of power, you see the cape, you notice red cape here, red cape here, right? You'll also notice the colors red, white, and blue right the sister she's wearing a white dress he's got the red cape he's got the blue um the blue uh, uh garbs right same thing over here blue cape red pants blue shoes white shirt right red feather we're gonna go further into that in a second but i just wanted to kind of point that out to everybody everybody's attention right so as you go through uh and this is actually from a uh i believe this is in peru I think this is at the Larco, if I'm not mistaken. Um, if not, you know, I'll see if I can uh, find the source for this. But this is this is in Peru, and you have a lot of different kings all throughout, all pretty much demonstrating the same vestments, right? You can also see the golden plate that they carry, right? Could be a throwback to the Levite priests of the Bible. Uh, again, going through the um the levant demonstration right there could be a shield okay so we can see right here every every king and then we get to the last two at the who was a very famous incan king then you also have carlos quinto it says right here if y'all can see that carlos quinto carlos quinto now a lot of people doubt the um the validity of when i say that the Moorish Europeans and the Moors in America knew each other and did trade with each other. But this right here proves it because you can see it's a disruption in the lineage. Okay. So the first thing is you can see as we go on, right? The traditional Incan uh, habits that the other Moors are sporting, right? We also have this right here, right? Okay. So this is how. This is the traditional Incan habit, right? You can see the type of fez that they used to wear. It's more so of like a golden crown. You can see the diadem up here and you can see the feathers up here, right? Should be very familiar to any Moorish American looking uh, at the video, but that's how they used to demonstrate theirs. And you can see the same thing here. See the, the diadem, the feather here, the fez, right? The scepter, like I said before, the scepter of power, which demonstrates discernment, right? Having good judgment. You can also see right here again, and even the same end on the scepter. Can you see that? The same end on the scepter here, same end on the scepter up here, right? So, and also same habits as you can see. Red, red, okay? Also red and blue, red and blue, right? So, this is the traditional habit of the Incas. We also have the other varied habit of the Incas from the other picture I just showed, this one right here. Right? This is more of a European influence, but still. Then you have Carlos Quinto, who was a European, who kind of married into the bloodline of the Incas. So now you can see a slight change. You can see the crown up here, right? 
demonstrating the European influence. Same thing here. You know, see? I'm sure you can. These, this crown here, and this crown here. Similar, very similar, right? Because this is more of a European influence. Nothing wrong with it necessarily, because again, as you can see, the European that we're talking about is still a Moor. And really, when we say European, that's even incorrect. We actually should be saying European. So let me um, let me also write that down. So we have Kunishot, Tasalagi, European, not European. European, whoops which later on became European because the word peon, a peon is like a worker, okay? It's like a low-class worker. So instead of European, right, you have the Euro peons, okay? That's where you get the term European, okay? But European and Europa, I'll write that too. Okay. That's kind of how it transliterated down. Okay. So you have Europa, European, European, Peon. Okay. So Carlos Quinto was of the European Moors, but he still had Christian influence, as you can see with this cross. Now, look at all of this lineage, right? Again, the traditional, um, going f further back into the old school Inca, right? Then Carlos Quinto begins to reign. Now you have a whole type of look. A whole different type of look when it comes to that demonstration, right? Excuse me, I gotta plug in my computer. Different type of look when it comes into that that demonstration, right? So now you have the um the necklace, right? Still the stars, but it's a different type of necklace now. We can get into that a little bit later on too. Um but the vestments change, right? So you see a lot, a lot of gold, very powerful, um, red, regal, just scepters and everything. Down here, not so much. You see these little scrolls that they're holding, right? They reference the scriptures that they were, you know, that they were um, bringing into the new world, right? That's when you get into uh, the Jesuits, the Capuchins. Let me let me Jesuits Cushions, I think is how you pronounce it. Uh the Dominicans. And not Dominicans like the nationality Dominicans, but the the European uh, missions. So I'll say the European Christian missions right um and those european missions these these european christian missions basically uh found strength here in america because of the um uh, the uh support of king ferdinand queen isabella uh, right after 1492 when granada fell you'll see a lot of uh, Christian missions coming over here um, after that fact, when we were not able to accurately or adequately defend ourselves anymore from foreign influence. So the European Christian missions, the Jesuits, Capuchins, Dominicans, a lot of these guys were linked up with those orders, right? That's why you see them holding books, scrolls, things like that. It's representing a changing of basically jurisdiction here, we have the indigenous Moorish jurisdiction, right? We have our own ruling class. We have our own structure. We have our own ways of thinking, right? That you see right here. Yeah. So 
that continuously moved into this after Carlos Quinto. Carlos Quinto was the end of that era and then moved into the next era here. You even see Charles the fourth, Charles the third, Philip the fourth, Charles the second, uh, Philip the fifth, Louis the first, Philip the fifth, Ferdinand. Ooh, does that say siete? I'm not sure, but um, Ferdinand, Fernando, Philip the second. So again, when you look up all of these names, right, they're gonna try to show you pale skin European faces. But I'm showing you right here, like for example, look up uh, Philip the Cero. So that's the third, right? Yeah. What am I talking about? Of course it is, because fourth is right here. But um, yeah, the second, the third, and the fourth. Look up. Okay, fine. Because this brother is even darker, right? Look up Philip the second and see what you find. This this right here, which is older than whatever painting is going to pop up on Google, right? This right here is saying that this is Philip the second right here right now go look up on google philip the second i guarantee you whoever pops up is not gonna look like this but then why does this look different from whatever it is that you that you saw right it's because a lot of those depictions were painted by um what are called friars right so let me friars and monks right who or again, a part of these orders, Domin uh, Jesuits, Dominicans, Capuchins, they're part of the Christian missions whose job it was to basically usurp the images and the icons. It's an entire, entire section of history. It's called iconoclasm, iconoclasm, right? And iconoclasm literally means to destroy. Clasm means to destroy and icono means the pictures. So iconoclasm is the destruction of pictures, okay? It was an entire movement in history dedicated to basically destroying our images, the images that we have of ourselves, okay? So, um, but this was before that period, this, this piece here, uh, which, was, which is from Peru. Um, this, is, this is before that period. So this is one of those, those artifacts that we have that is untouched because of that okay um, yeah couldn't show wonderful wonderful morris look at the drip people talk about drip look at this the gold right Psst. come on man the dagger right um a lot of beautiful stuff so there's also a misconception that our flag is not necessarily our flag like the flag of the usa is not really our flag it ain't got nothing to do with us right so again let's look up uh let's let's let me look at this real, real quick right so i hear a lot of rhetoric about that too that the usa flag is not our flag right so as we can see right here the plume feathers of the ancient indigenous people here you see them all around red white and blue red white and blue you can see the sister right here right red white and blue red white and blue red white and blue red white and blue and this is this is how we were in our natural habit okay we went to go out hunting fishing and things like that it's a natural habit that we were in you can even see the tip of the the arrow that he's using right here it's a star and it even has five points one two three four five okay so you already see the science and he's, it looks like he's aiming at a bird so you you see the science already even the bird itself the red the white and the blue because it represents us being tied to our natural habitat our natural land look at the look at the plant red white and blue you see it everywhere you see it everywhere it's because that's who we were in our natural element we didn't even have to worry about uh, being misrepresented or misidentified because we knew who we were right furthermore a shout out to Asir the Duke of Tears for this one because this really hit me this is an Egyptian stele this is the uh, stella of the priest Hahat I looked at, uh, I mean I'll write that down soon 
Stele of High Oops Least Okay So that's what this is right here This is the stele of the high priest Hahat But it look real familiar don't it Look at it Look real real familiar don't it Because It's this It's this So let's look at all that right Bring up the brother again, right? Can y'all see? This is truly what it is, okay? So, what we don't understand about this flag right here, this this beautiful flag right here is the fact that it's a cosmic flag it's an esoteric metaphysical cosmic flag it has nothing to do with a corporation it has nothing to do with any of, excuse me any of that any of that okay now i get it the u.s is a corporation the usa is a country i get it i understand all of that but furthermore than that we have to look at it from a metaphysical point of view because that's what this country was built off of metaphysical principles okay that's the reason why one of the so-called founding fathers of this this nation was a freemason george washington can y'all see that y'all see this right george washington was a freemason a practicing freemason i think he was 32nd degree okay He's at least a master mason. It says right here, he's initiated November 4th, 1752 in Fredericksburg, lumber, uh, Lodge Number no. 4, Virginia. Passed, which means he passed to the second degree, March 3rd, 1753. And then raised, which means he was raised to the, the third degree, the sublime degree of a master mason, August 4th, 1753. You can even see how they allude to the Moors here. <laughs> they put it right here. They put it right here. But if you don't have the... <laughs> the wisdom <laughs> to see the wisdom of the moors then that will go right by you see they're representing the natural habitat of the people right behind it but it's all veiled it's veiled in allegory demonstrated by signs and symbols right you can even see the star up top the five-pointed star one two three four five which is the true symbol of masonry the, the star the star of consciousness right not the g and the compass the g and the compass came later this this whole thing this is the result of a um a photographer who wanted to just he thought this was a cool thing at least that's the cover story in reality that this configuration is actually laid on the bible when they do their initiatic um rituals and rites so um i think it's like uh one when one is on top of the other it represents whichever degree you're going into so when when one is halfway up and halfway down then it, it represents the certain this degree and then the, when the compass is on top of the square it's the next degree when the square is on top of the compass it's the next degree so it depends on what degree you're going into is however these are configured but it varies but based on wherever it is you're going so again a lot of symbolism here um but this this symbolism in particular is one of the most telling and one of the most important i think so you can see right here the coffin right so this this is emblematic of a brother named hiram right so in the masonic degrees right hiram was a phoenician right Hiram was a Phoenician, and uh, I'll just, I'll read some of what it says right here. So Hiram the first Phoenician, um, oh Lord, excuse me. Uh, Phoenician, Hiram was the Phoenician king of Tyre, a place called Tyre, Tyre's in Lebanon. According to the Hebrew Bible, uh, his his regnal years have been calculated by some as 980 to 947 BC in succession to his father, Habibal. Hiram was succeeded as king of Tyre by his son, Balester. Um, Hiram was also mentioned in the writings of Menander of Hephaestus, 
They're preserved as uh, Ho Hophis Josephus against Apion, which adds to the biblical account. According to Josephus, Hiram lived for 53 years and reigned for 34. So this grave, whenever you see Masonic, like uh, these are called trestle boards. Um, mo most of the time, this isn't really a trestle board. This is like a decorative version of a trestle board, but basically it's it's a trestle board um also by just just for for reference i'm not a freemason i should i should say that right now i'm not a freemason i never have been i was never in the lodge i never took an oath initiation or anything like that um so i just i know about the science and the inner science of freemasonry so i'm i'm showing y'all right now you can also see of course <laughs> you see the american flag up top right but kind of pinned to the back a little bit and draped right draped and covered by the rest of the symbolism because that's what they're in the business of doing they they cover up a lot of what's actually happening so anyway Hiram when he was uh hidden in his head and laid in a shallow grave to the towards the north the reason why he was laid in a shallow grave in the north is because to them uh and to I guess to a certain extent there's no light in the north right light comes from the east and it travels to west it spreads across the south but technically it doesn't touch north at least allegedly to, to their um you know to their cosmo cosmology so he was hit Hiram was was hitting his head and laid in a shallow grave in the north because he wanted to be placed well they wanted to place him in darkness the reason why the grave is shallow is because he still has the potential to get up out of his grave this is the later on um uh, degrees of masonry that's why it says um when you become a master mason and become raised is because you, you are now taking the office of Hiram so basically you are the master before you even take the the first degree of initiation but then once you take entrance into their rites and rituals now you're you're blind you're basically dead in the ground right so that's why you're hitting the head laid in a shallow grave in the north you're now dead and now you have to rework all of the degrees to get back up to where you were before and raise back up again the only issue is you'll never be able to get to where you were before <laughs> because you've undergone you know um certain things certain things um and you've you've been subject to certain spiritual forces through these initiations so i'm not, again i'm not speaking bad about freemasonry or nothing like that but you know there's certain things that do need to be known so uh, the coffin, which which in it lies Hiram Abiff, the Phoenician, the Moor, because the Phoenicians are the ancient Canaanites, and the Canaanites are Moors. So, again, just imagine one of the beautiful brothers I just showed you before. This is representative of Hiram, if Hiram was just who he was, right? But now they've hit him in the head, laid him in a shallow grave in the north. But you do see the sprig of acacia on on the side, right? So let's let's also get into that too, right? So I'll say Freemasonry. Oops. Freemasonry. And I'll say Hiram. Lord. Hiram Abif. Abif means like risen. Like like he, he rises again. So Hiram Abif. Um of Tyre, I'll say. Of Tyre. And um what did I say? Sprig of Acacia. The sprig of Acacia. Now, what the sprig of acacia represents, which is this little plant right here, right? The sprig of acacia is placed by the head of Hiram, if you notice that, right? The reason why it's placed at the head of Hiram is because there's still consciousness here. There's still life inside of the grave, okay? It represents, even though there's a temporary death, there's always the possibility of life and resurrection that's what the sprig of acacia represents again if you notice it's at the head and not at the foot of the coffin see the head would be up here 
you also notice uh this little mark on the on the coffin right here if you look up certain trestle boards like hang on um i'll say masonic trestle board right let's see if we can find a nice one here this has it on it no but again again you can see the star up here you can see the coffin down here and the spring of acacia um right here so see the star again the same star that you saw here meaning the star of consciousness the star of light okay where's the i want to bring it up so you can see no not that <clears throat> here Right. And the same star that you saw here. Right? Same star. Oops. See that? same star what that star represents is consciousness that star represents basically the soul okay it's an ancient symbol and you can find it in many many different moorish um civilizations all around the world okay that star is representative of love truth peace freedom and justice the five principles of every moor every moorish american and all throughout all more civilization the stars here star here star here it's the star of consciousness okay that star is very very important because it represents you knowing who you are okay now we're going to get into the book saga america by barry fell right saga america by barry fell right this is from page 226 of saga america dr muhammad ja Jar Jari, uh, who's on the left, points to the first Kufic inscription to be recognized in North America. The word Shams in Arabic, sun, found with a red ochre representation of a sun disk, replicated to half scale from the find in from the find site in Texas. Discovered in 1935, it was originally reported as a black worm-shaped marking accompanying what appeared to be a sun disk. And its true nature was first noted by Fell at a lecture in the University of Maine, 1976. This first visit to Harvard by Dr. Jari and Ali Kushem Wright in 1977 led, closer, led to closer collaboration between North African and American investigators, and thus to the discovery of numerous Kufic inscriptions in other parts of North America. So again, they try to say that the Carthaginians didn't make it to America, the Phoenicians didn't make it to America. But again, then to that, we have to ask some questions, right?
if that's the case this right here let's focus let's focus on the urn for a second right metal urn decorated with phoenician themes in the upper part up here you can even see the the nemesis crown right oh why not open here we go the nemesis crown this is called the nemesis crown in egypt right the nemesis crown right here right okay they fixed the goddess a start with the egyptian inspired ornament below apparently african rain dancers the style of mixed derivation requ recalls the work of cypriot phoenicians around 600 bc when such objects were manufactured for distribution and sale okay uh, let's also look at that too right nemesis crown okay nemesis crown all right Oh. Um, when such objects were manufactured for distribution and sale mainly to sem semi-civilized barbarians that's a way to diss the moors but okay by the traders of carthage this urn was discovered in an excava excavation carried out by the middlebury archaeological research center near the junction of the susquehanna and Chen chenango with rivers in new york phoenician inscriptions had earlier been recognized in the susquehanna region by philip Besslin and dr william w strong okay so this this urn right here was found in new york it's found in in uh the sudden at the susquehanna river in new york but it's got phoenician inscriptions all over it and it's got a, a ancient comedic <laughs> headdress on the joint what does that tell you <laughs> they found it buried in america but it got all that on it, huh? You can even see the the uh, the snake, the wajet snake up here, huh? You can see it up there. <laughs> so what does that tell you? This was buried in America, man. Okay. There's also the alabaster egg carrying the cartoons, the official name seal of the Egyptian pharaoh Tut in common, discovered in Idaho. What? <laughs> what? So this 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 egg, a carved egg, got Tut in common's name on it, and it was discovered in Idaho somewhere. Idaho. Come on, man. Come on, man. <laughs> uh, but we didn't trade with each other. There was no there was no international trade huh that's what they try to say that's what they try to say but don't believe it man don't believe it the, the natives of the free natives of dominica you can see right here again the turban and the fez you can see the fez up top he even took his his um like a naval hat or something like that off he took that hat off to put this one on because this is the one that says that he's free He's wearing his fez right here. He's, he's saying that he's free. Again, look at the colors. Red, white, and blue, huh? Red, white, and blue. And the sisters, they got the hat on and the turban. Look at the turban, guys. Turban, red, white, and blue. Pink. <laughs> right? Because it's all the same thing. It's all the same thing. It's just different ways that we were demonstrating ourselves at different times. That's all. But it's all ours. Look at the complexion of the people. Has it changed yet? From any of the stuff that I've shown you, has the complexion of the people changed yet? Absolutely not. This is how you know we are the Canaanites. We are the Phoenicians. We are the Carthaginians. We are the Hittites and Amorites. Whenever you look up any of these people up and do the research on what it is, these are Moors. These, <laughs> these are the original inhabitants of, of this country. Period. Like, it's, cl it's clear. It is, it is clear that that's what it is. So, I mean, I, I got even more. Um, give me one second. I might have to pause the video. I'll be back. So, I got another piece too. So, soon after the 1976 publication of America BC, which is another another book by Barry Fell. Let's make this one 
Oh, let me write down the brother's name too. Say author Barry Fell, right? Huh? Soon after the 1976 publication of America BC, in which inscriptions in ancient Mediterranean uh, languages were reported from the eastern parts of North America, it was discovered that many supposed Indian petroglyphs of the western states are also ancient inscriptions. Above, a prayer for rain in the Punic language of Carthage at Massacre Lake Nevada, originally reported by professional archaeologists in 1958. Though not then recognized as writing, the letters read from a right to left, Q-M-T-R-I-B. May the clouds spew forth rain. Okay. Below, a Punic dedication in the same script and language from Constantine, Algeria. Mutumbal, son of Aram, dedicated this tablet. So that's what it says on, on the second line, right? But it's the same inscription if you look. It's the same thing, same letters and everything. Okay. Same way it's written and everything. So again, proving that the ancient, the ancient Carthaginians, Phoenicians, Canaanites were in America. Okay. And that we are descendants of those people because those are the customs and traditions that we had. Um, like I said before, and just to loop it back in since we're on Saga America, um, again, from the sun, the Kufic inscription for the sun, right? The sun disc. Okay. That is just the same thing. Also, let me. So you can see the sun disk here and the sun disk here. You can see the Nemes crown here and the Nemes crown here. Okay? Proving that there was at least some contact between one side of our family on one side of the world and another side of the family on the other side of the world. They try to make it as if we never knew each other. We were all divided. It was all different kingdoms and dynasties that had nothing to do with each other. When I'm telling you and showing you that this and this were both found in America. And again, if you want to get that book, you can get the book. Uh, it was by a guy named Barry Fell. Barry Fell. And the name of the book is Saga. Oops. America. Okay. It's, it's very clear. <laughs> it's very clear, man. Um, it's another thing I could talk about too. Did y'all know that there was a mummy that was found in America? <laughs> It says 10,000 year old spirit cave mummy revealed as belonging to an early caravan of immigrants to the Americas. A new twist in the mapping of early human migrations into North and South America has incurred after DNA samples from the 10,000 year old spirit cave mummy <laughs> unearthed in a cave in Nevada, of all places, Nevada. <laughs> For like Vegas, bro. <laughs> Revealed its ancestor of a Native American tribe. The skeleton, a male aged about around 40 at the time of his death, was found in a Nevada cave in 1940 wearing moccasins on his feet and with his body wrapped in a rabbit skin blanket covered with reed mats. 
Now, Professor Exki Willerslev, who works with the University of Copenhagen and the University of Cambridge, has published the Spirit Cave Mummy's DNA sequencing in the journals. This is this is uh, how the mummy was preserved. Okay. <laughs> it says. Uh, Willerslev interpreted the mummy's DNA results against dozens of ancient specimens spanning around 10,000 years and locations from Alaska to Patagonia. The findings highlighted the power of ancient DNA to, re to reveal untold stories of the distant past, right? Okay. So, they're trying to say that, yes, this is a mummy. And yes, we found it here in America. And yes, all that. But, you know... That has nothing to do with the people here already in America. That has to do with some other type of people who came to America a long time ago. Even this. They try to read, you know, whatever with that. But watch this. I know I had it. I know I had that joint, bro. Like, uh, go here. Yeah, there you go. So they try to say that they they looked for DNA specimens. Uh, what did it say? Against dozens of ancient specimens spanning around ten thousand years, right? At least ten thousand years ago. Islam Moors, right? So, <laughs> 10,000 years ago, but then you look and there's this story, right? Opened it twice. It says DNA evidence has revealed the oldest known common male ancestor is 340 years old. Islam. <laughs> Let me, uh, Oh, excuse me about that quick um had to do something so the reason why i i bring in a lot of this um egyptian um representation and stuff like that is the fact that this is this is the house of the temple this is in the scottish right uh freemasonry temple it's called the house of the temple it's here in uh, dc right and as you can see, there's hieroglyphics all over. Okay, so uh, getting back to it, this is the house of the temple right here, right? And the house of the temple got all these hieroglyphics on it. The house of the temple is the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry Temple. It's in DC, right? Uh, I've been there before. Maybe I'll go back there again one day and actually do a video about it and stuff like that. Demonstrate a little bit on like the uh, symbolism and stuff like that. It's a lot of symbolism in that place. So, again, when you go back to the Freemasonry thing, the reason why I harp on Freemasonry so much is because it relies on the fact that the so-called Negro, Black, and Coloreds don't know who they are. And that's pretty much... Uh, the basis for the new America that, that they speak about, right? This new America. Um, so a lot of Freemasonry is actually based on ancient Egyptian uh, symbolism, rites, and rituals, right? Um, you see a lot of like pyramids, a lot of uh, um, Nemi's crowns and stuff like that, all in Freemasonry, right? So, that being said, this is our culture. Again, you see the sun disk. The sun disk here, which really represents the star of consciousness, which resides in each and every one of us. Right? You even see the, the imitation of the Moorish vestments here. So, you see, he's trying to go for that cape and, and cloak kind of look. Whereas this is the original, right? And again, it all revolves around being in that coffin. This more being hit in his head 
laid in a shallow grave in the north in a coffin, being blind to who it is that he actually is, where they build temples in imitation of our temples and adorn their temples with our science. This is all our science. Okay. So, like I was saying a little earlier, right? Oops. So, like I was saying a little bit earlier, right? The brother, they screamed, I mean, they, um, they looked at this brother. They found that his, his DNA, right? I think I, I think I stopped off here, right? The oldest known common male ancestor is 340,000 years old, more than twice as old as previous estimates. Look at this. New report uh, comes from a, a recently deceased man named Albert Perry. After the African-American so-called South Carolina man died, one of his relatives submitted a sample of his DNA to a company called Family Tree DNA for analysis. The findings were published in the American Journal of Human Genetics and may require researchers to adjust the known timeline of humankind's evolution. Um, all previously DNA, all previously compared DNA samples pointed to a common Y chromosome traced back to a man who lived between 60,000 and 140,000 years ago. Well, Perry's DNA sample broke the trend, not matching up with this common ancestor. So this is a random brother from South Carolina that they, they tested the DNA of, and they found out that this brother's DNA goes back 340 times, 40,000 times more than what they thought. And they found this mummy, the spirit cave mummy in Nevada. But even that is only 10,000 years, 10,000, right? Versus, it's crazy, man. 10,000 versus 340,000. So our DNA is, 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 our DNA, we don't even understand how ancient we are. It said that time never was and man was not. Meaning we, there is no starting point to our origin. The, 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 the sooner that they try to find, okay, this is where these people started. We know this for sure. This is the beginning. Da, 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 da. That's not even true. Look, I did the calculations, right? This is another, another thing that I wanted to get into, right? I did the calculations of pretty much when the ancient Egyptian uh, dynasties was around, right? So it's been 5,123 years, one month and 19 days since 3100 BC, the beginning of 3100 BC, according to the, the uh, prole proleptic Julian calendar, right? So again, look at these numbers. Look at these numbers, y'all. <laughs> Look at these numbers. Around the the iconic Egyptian pyramid, I mean period, period, right? Tomorey, Tomorean, Kemetic Egyptian period, right? That's five thousand years, right? But the spirit cave mummy in Nevada is ten thousand years. Whoa! The spirit cave um, mummy in Nevada is ten thousand years, and our DNA. Is 340,000 years. <laughs> so we're older than all of it. We are the oldest out of it all. I know this is a lot of history, it's a lot of science and, and all that, but look, 340,000 is bigger than 10,000 and, and 500, what is it, 5,123 combined, bruh. It's older than, we are older than all of it combined. This random brother from South Carolina. <laughs> Let me write that down too, man. Let me write that down. Albert Perry, right? Um, comment below if you want me to add these uh to um the description. Or um, I can actually send it to people if you actually um, donate or maybe I'll put it on Patreon or something like that. But you can actually have these notes um, so you can have like the references and stuff like that. 
um 340,000 year old dna i'll say okay <laughs> um i'll add some of the other uh, links to these as well so you guys can understand um where all this com comes from and stuff like that but yeah so yeah man basically <laughs> we're we're older than all of it man we are older than all of it combined it just makes me laugh you gotta laugh at it sometimes because they really try to minimize us to a certain kind of point but again man it, it just when you know who you are nobody can lie to you when you have knowledge yourself man nobody can lie to you um <clears throat> I also wanted to build on this brother. His name was Yaru Mamut. And Yaru Mamut was a Muslim. He was a Moorish Muslim who actually moved to Washington, D.C. Uh, he was he was um, sold and ended up in Washington, D.C. And he lived Yes, man. Okay. All right. So the brother Yaro Mamut. Yaro Mamut. Okay. So the brother Yaro Mamut. Um, he was a Fulani Muslim, and well, he's a Muslim, and um. He was sold into slavery. He uh, was brought to Maryland, and his master's name was Samuel Beale. And he he lived in uh, Tacoma Park. He lives on a plantation in Tacoma Park. And it says, after 44 years of slavery, Yarrow gained freedom at the age of 60, and Brooke Beale died in 1796. Manumitted by enslavers who believed him too old to work anymore, he immediately spent 20 pounds to buy and free his seven-year-old son, Aquila who had been born to slavery on a neighboring farm. Little is known of the boy's mother. So, he had savings and became one of the first investors in the successful Columbia Bank of Georgetown. So this brother went from a slave to an investor. In 1800, he purchased a lot located at 3324 Dent Place, Northwestern Georgetown. And valued a tax assessment of $30 in 1800. So that's probably a lot of money, man. Um... He constructed a log house on the land. By 1816, the property had an assessed value of $500 or um, $11,174.2022. Y'all lived quietly on the dividends of his bank stock. So his brother was getting paid. Paid. He remained a devout, lifelong Muslim, praying regularly and avoiding the consumption of pork and liquor. So... Oh, and this right here. Yarrow died on January 19th, 1823, at the approximate age of 86. According to his obituary penned by Charles Wilson Peel, he's buried in the corner of his yard where he was accustomed to pray. However, a 2015 archaeological dig failed to unearth any remains. Peel's obituary was published in the Gettysburg Compiler and was reproduced in 38 newspapers across the United States, testifying to the unique story of the enslaved African Muslim turned entrepreneur and property owner. So, man, listen, look at this. <laughs> I didn't even know this. Two years after his father's death, Aqu Aquila purchased a farm in Washington County, Maryland, and moved there with his wife, Mary Polly Turner, a midwife and formerly enslaved person. The community of Yarrowsburg, Maryland, was named in her honor. A great grandnephew, Robert Turner Ford, graduated from Harvard University. So, it's a Yarrowsburg. I didn't even know that. Yarrowsburg, Maryland. And this is named after Yarrow Mamu. Look, it don't even mention Yarrow Mamu. It says the village is named for Aquila and Polly Yarrow. <laughs> so it don't even mention the brother, but, you know. It's a good example of them trying to cover up history right there. We just done seen who it comes from. Right? And actually says his African name was probably Mamadou Yaro. So that makes sense. Mamadou Yaro was his was his name. 
and then his children were known as Aquila and um, his wife um, Mary Yarrow. Okay, so Yarrowsburg, Maryland. But it mentions his 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 um uh his son and his wife, but not him. But yeah, so another reason why Moors have been coming to America through slavery or otherwise and getting money. How is it you a slave and then as soon as you get free, now you you know you know enough and you're intelligent enough to become an investor and purchase property. How you purchase property after being a slave. Just it's all a lot, you know what I'm saying? Just it doesn't make any sense. None of it makes sense. And it's all because of this. It's all just <laughs> To cover up who it is that you actually are. Islam Wars, I'm out. I'm out. Y'all, y'all get the message. Um, know who you are, know that self. And don't give in to the folly, man. Don't even give in to it. There's so much history that we have, and so much more I could show you. Uh, and I will be showing y'all in future videos. Comment down below if you want to see anything uh from me, any custom videos that I could make. Um, I'll see what I can do. Please, just stay yourself, man. Islam, peace and love.